This is a little uh, <clears throat> collection of uh, truism, truisms that aren't. I actually apologize a little bit because uh, we covered this first one uh, uh, last year, but many of you weren't here, so we'll, we'll just kind of nail it and then we'll move on. You are either a Toradol liking doctor or you're not a Toradol liking doctor. And Keterolak is more generically speaking. And um, this first is a myth that, is, that's a, that uh, says that this drug is substantially superior to oral NSAIDs and is among the most potent and safest of the NSAIDs. In um, papers one, two, and three, they're all the same. And I, these are the only papers that you need to know about this because these are the only people, papers that were done on it. This is comparing ibuprofen and Keterolac, IM, shots. So PO, ibuprofen, I, uh, IM, Keterolac, and every study showed the same results. The onset of analgesia was similar. Intensity of analgesia was similar, because NSAIDs do have this ceiling level kind of thing where for pain, uh, it's like 400 of ibuprofen, and the duration of analgesia was similar. They're identical. So you give oral ibuprofen or a shot of Keterolac IM, and uh, these pa three papers all came to the same conclusion. And they are all old papers. The stuff is uh, like no big secret kind of thing. Paper four is a summary of the first three. Isn't that great? You can make your own paper by summarizing three other people's papers, and you get to be a publisher. So the answer is clearly in. So that doesn't mean you can't use this drug for treating back pain. Just don't have any delusion that it matters. And if that, that is a huge improvement right there because some of you believe that this matters. This is a good drug. And when they could have just as easily taken a handful of Motrin and say, what kind of doctor are you? I can get Motrin over the drugstore you know, anytime. I need something decent. Okay, well, here's your shot of uh, Toradol then. As long as you understand that this is basically for their head, not for their back, then that will be fine. And, you know, it's an improvement. Because um, we are at our hospital have this little computer program, and, uh, and we know every drug is given out since, uh, by, by every individual doctor since 1993. So we have hundreds of thousands of patients in this database. And you can see really large variation in physician practice in this process. Because we see doctors giving this stuff out for back pain all the time, maybe because they think that um, the patients will think that this matters. Um, as long as they don't think it matters, I think that that accomplishes the goal. Number five gets a little bit more specific and says, well, how long does it take to get peak blood levels? Orally, 30 to 53 minutes was the range. IM is even slower than oral, 45 to 50 minutes. IV is fast. So you're talking about biliary col colic, you read oral colic, we're not talking about that. Five minutes, that's fine. It, it has the special use in those cases, that's good. Serum half-life is five or six hours, no matter how you give it. And there is this other concept that is in paper number five. 25% of people don't respond to this as a, as a class. Um, there are responders, non-responders, and that paper, I think, says 25%. That's a lot that don't get any, any response out of this. And to prove the concept, Number six is basically comparing Keterolac with um, 50 milligrams of oral indomethacin for the treatment of gout, 20 people. Um, despite its being partially funded by Hoff and LaRoche, there was no difference in efficacy found. Like what would a possible, that was a really a screw up. A, a drug company funded study that found no difference? I mean, they should have suppressed that thing. Anybody knows that that's not a good idea, you know? And then seven is another old paper. And even this paper, a long, long time ago, said uh, it discusses the potential overestimation of the utility of this drug. Yet it represents about, and actually I thought this is not unreasonable, it represents 10% of the injectable analgesia market in 2007. So that was in the States, it was 302 million bucks, and this was 10% of it. There's a new drug coming out. I, I often wonder why is there only one injectable end state in the United States for the last 20 years? Why wouldn't somebody else to, like to get into this market? Because the anesthesiologists seem to be enamored with this drug. I mean, they're using this all the time as kind of like, so we'll give you less morphine, we'll kind of supplement it with some Toradol. In a patient who just had uh, surgery, this drug screws up your platelets. I didn't get it. 
But in any case, there's an injectable form of ibuprofen that is in phase three, three trials right now in the States called Amelior. It's going to be a trade name. I don't know. Maybe it'd be better. Maybe it won't be better. Number eight uh, is, summarizes this whole kit and caboodle. And it says, this is a review of 10 randomized st uh, studies uh, uh, of the use of NSAIDs by different routes. And it says, this is a quote, in renal colic, there is evidence that NSAIDs act quickest when given intravenously. This, must, this may be clinically relevant. In all other pain conditions, there is a lack of evidence of any difference between routes. In pain conditions other than renal colic, there is therefore a strong argument to give oral NSAIDs when patients can swallow. And then the next paper is talking about the safety profile of this drug. And there's a couple of papers here to say, be careful. Um, this drug was taken off the market in seven Western European countries, maybe back on, but it was because of its side effect profile, not because of its efficacy. So nine is an example. Keterolic induced ischemic irreversible renal failure in a sickle cellar. So the idea is that sickle cases, you want to keep them away from narcotics as much as possible. But the fact is that this drug in, uh, in, inhibits renal blood flow in a subset of patients who have blood flow problems. So the pain of, of sickle cell is ischemic pain. So the ischemic pain in the back, the ischemic pain in their limbs, the uh, similar process is going on in the kidneys, decreasing blood flow, and now you're giving on, on top of it a drug that inhibits it. So you could th see theoretically why you may get into some trouble. Then, then, then number 10 was a, just a case report of some poor guy who had a pacemaker put in and gave him one shot of Keterolac and took his kidneys out for a little while. And the GI effects are 11 and 12. The uh, number 11 looked at the odds ratio for, for NSAIDs to cause a hospitalizable GI bleed. And um, they compared people coming into the hospital, what NSAID were you on, what NSAID were you on, were you on any NSAID at all? And the risk of a GI bleed with oral Keterolac was 25 times greater than being on no NSAID. And to put that in perspective, the risk of a GI bleed, hospitalizable GI bleed, was three times greater being on ibuprofen. 25 times greater with Keterolac, three times greater with ibuprofen. Was that a fluke? No. You go to paper number 12, 1,500 Italians, upper GI bleeds, the relative risk of bleeding with Keterolac was 24.7 versus 2.1 for ibuprofen. Um, and the other thing about this that makes it clear that this drug is a, really atypical NSAID is you're only allowed to give it for five days. You look at a package insert kind of thing, and it's only supposed to be given when you're on it parentally in the hospital. You're allowed a total dose of uh, uh, over, over five days. That's it, um, including the days that you were getting it by shot. And the pill form of this stuff is less than the IM form of this drug or the IV form. The pill form is 10 milligrams. Where do you see a drug? You got 10 milligrams orally, 15 or 30, or used to be 60 milligrams IM. It's bass acres. So this is, as Billy Mallon would say, the Black and Decker stomach wrecker. The second uh, cluster of papers is about um, why don't we use local anesthesia to start IVs, particularly in kids. Uh, any of you uh, ever had your kid have an operation at some children's hospital? Anybody here ever have their kid have it? Did they use uh, some kind of local anesthetic when they started the kid's IV? Versed. So my, actually, not this one. Uh, my youngest uh, son had a little surgery there, uh, elective surgery. Then when they came into the Children's Hospital of, of Los Angeles for that, they slapped on some, at that time, they slapped on some uh, Emla cream onto both dorsums of the wrist with a um, uh, plastic dressing over top, you know, one of those um, adherent pieces of cellophane kind of thing. And by the time that you get registered and they, they keep on asking you over and over and over, does Johnny have any allergies, ad nauseum? Like, did, did you hear it the first time kind of thing? Yeah, they, everybody's so important. Anyway, by the time they do that, they can start an IV in the dorsum of their hands. And so this is kind of routine practice at um, pediatric hospitals is to be sensitive to the fact that these kids can freak out. 
And you've all seen kids who have had bad medical experiences, and when they see you in your white coat, they just freak because it reminds them of the bad experience they had before, and the kids are just out of control. We've all seen some of those kids. So these are the papers that kind of make the case. Let's take a small incremental amount of time to make this process a little less painful, particularly for the kids. And the summary of the papers, I mean, there, there are no papers that say don't do this. They all say do it, and nobody, and, and nobody does it. Any of you work at your ER where they use a little an, an, an anesthesia for topical or local or for an, uh, IVs? Yes. Yours? Yes? And you too? Yes. See, the Australians are civilized, you know? They have nitrous oxide that they can give. They don't have uh, uh, patient satisfaction surveys, you know? They have, you know, all of these things. All right, anybody else who do this? Because honestly, we had a policy at our department where I was, I, I've been the director there for, they've tolerated me for 20 some years, since 1985. That we were gonna do, I, we were gonna do all the IVs that were not gonna be commando, life threat, life, you gotta have it right this minute kind of thing. Every one of those, the nurses could use a little alkalinized lidocaine, little, make a little bee sting kind of thing there uh, to make these IVs less painful. When I had my gallbladder extracted a couple dozen years ago, the nurse anesthetist at the hospital said, I'm going to give you a little lidocaine, I'm going to start an IV. And I was like, wow, what? I really, really appreciated her doing that because I'm fundamentally a coward kind of thing. And if you miss the IV, when you have to start another one, well, then that wouldn't hurt. I can do, you know, I can tolerate the other one. But, you know, we just, uh, there is a... There's pain that we have to endure and pain we don't have to endure. This is pain we don't have to endure if, we, if somebody's just willing to take a little bit of time. So what techniques do you use at your hospital for that? Occasionally just put a blob of MRI and put a film back in the middle of the Blob? And your hospital's same? Yeah, the same thing. Routine and breakfast the same as well. So, so we're kind of the uh, oddballs here, basically. What about the Canadians? You do it too? That's not true. And is it a blob of something that you put on there as well? Yeah. Embla? The problem with Embla is basically it takes like 40, it's, it's slow, it's 45 minutes. And you know, there is another cream that's available. I'll show you the, some papers on it called uh, uh, ELA Max, or I, I forget, I, I'll show you the name of it. It's over the counter, it's 4% lidocaine. It's $50 a tube. I'm not so sure why it's so expensive. But you can't be using all that much, a little dabble do you kind of thing. Uh, is anybody using any injection of uh, xylocaine, you know, 30 gauge needle, little bleb kind of thing? And is this only in kids or is this adults too? Pardon me? So, and the idea of having the nurses can do it on their own say so? Yeah, okay. So the Canadians and, the, and the, the Australians are telling us that this is not such a wacky idea. The literature on it is frankly compelling. It basically shows that it works and it doesn't make it start, harder to start an IV. It's not an issue about, I can't see the veins now. I mean, that's all, all of the objections have been looked at and basically discarded in, the, in these studies. Although clearly these people doing this are you know, prejudiced in favor of the technique and the idea of doing it. But it's nice to see that uh, you know, there's groups of people do it. Any of you in the US do it? Really? The problem with using the nurse's discretion is that uh, they won't, I, won't, I don't trust them to do it. I think everybody should have an 18 gauge IV started every six months. I think all of us should have an unnecessary organ removed every year <clears throat> so that we can be given a gown that doesn't cover our tush, given a, a butt, a bell that's not connected to any, anything, so you're madly pressing this thing, nobody's coming, you know. We need to be on the other side of it periodically so that we can kind of get uh, the sense of what it's like to be a, a, in the dependent role of a patient. So our policy was it wasn't their, at their discretion because I, I, I was of the view, they won't do it, they'll just blow it off. Um, but 
They only did it when I was working. You know, it was pretty clear because I'd have to, you know, when I was working, uh, I would say to them, hey, what, what about the xylocaine? Because we had all these little bottles of buffered xylocaine and 27 gauge needles for a little, uh, um, but they just weren't into it. Um, have your nurses, do most of them do it? Well, that's encouraging, actually. Uh, so the, the idea here is for you to go back and show the nurses, here's 15 papers that say, let's give this a whack kind of thing, and, and let's start an 18 gauge. Before we do it, we're going to start an 18 gauge on each of, each of us. Um, I remember when I was applying to get into medical school, um, I lived in Philadelphia. There's a lot of medical schools in Philadelphia, and they've been there for hundreds of years. Thomas Jefferson founded them, kind of thing, you know. And so. Uh, I got to interview at a bunch of them, and one of the schools, it was Jefferson University, uh, said, <clears throat> oh no, we, start, we pass NG tubes on ourselves, and we start IVs on ourselves, and we do, a, I didn't want to hear about the Foley catheters, and, uh, <clears throat> and that, I, I just scratched that school right, right off the list, that list, that school's out of here, I'm not going there, kind of thing. But I do think it, the patients generally appreciate the effort, and the parents in particular, even if it doesn't work as well as you'd like. Just the idea that you made the effort to make Johnny's IV less painful, man, you get lots of points, lots of points. So um, this, the, the long and short of it, um, decreases pain and anxiety. And when you look at these pain scales in terms of are we accomplishing much, they all basically say, yeah, we're moving down two or three points on the uh, visual analog pain scale. It's something that would be considered to be clinically significant and appreciated. There's a paper there that, that is, is kind of discouraging. It's about British anesthesiologists, or as they say over there, anesthetists, um, having a, a, either a lack of awareness of this literature or those who claim to be aware of it just basically ignored it and said it was not clinically important and they basically therefore didn't embrace it. Um, depending on the agent, these topical uh, things suffer from leading, leading relatively long contact periods. So they talk about this ELA max, which is this over-the-counter, which is now called LMX, LMX, 4% liposomal lidocaine, applied for 30 minutes, and the studies are in here, basically is a, about equivalent to the subcutaneous lidocaine if you're going to do that. Uh, and papers 17 to 21 are all positive regarding the injection of lidocaine. So if you just read the conclusions of 17 to 21, it all, there's no paper here that says, don't bother. There are some papers here that are a little disappointing, like the ones that talk about spraying cold stuff on there. The, um, um, what do they call that stuff? It? Ethyl chloride. Now they, the, the Joint Commission took ethyl chloride away from us. When they came about 10 years ago, they got rid of that thing because they thought it was like a blowtorch kind of thing, like a flamethrower, because it was flammable. Well, well most of us don't smoke around uh, the, the ethyl chloride when we're using it, but you know, they're, it's, they're so, it's so typical of taking stuff away that worked just fine, thank you very much. Now there are other products that are vapor coolant products that are used and uh, are non-flammable that you can buy. We bought some, it's a, it's a little expensive, but the idea of doing it before you're, or supplementing, um, something that's locally painful, it's a good idea, patients appreciate it, tends to work. So 17, 18, 19, it's all basically the same stuff. And they're talking about using 27 or 30 gauge needles, buffered lidocaine because it burns less when you inject it, making a little bleb, starting it, if you miss it, the next one won't be, uh, they won't be dreading the next stick. Because you know, you just hear the nurses say, little stick, little stick, you know, as this umbrella is going up their forearm kind of thing. Um, yeah, I think that that's the summary there. 25 through 30 are all papers that talk about newer techniques to provide local anesthesia. Any of you use any of these newer techniques, like 25 is a needle-free injector, just kind of blasts it into the skin like a, you're getting your immunizations in the army where they just kind of blast this stuff up against your deltoid. Needle-free injection is 26, iontophoresis is 27, laser-assisted topical anesthesia 28, number 29 is another laser thing, 30, ultrasound-facilitated topical anesthesia. All of these things, I wouldn't invest in any of them because 
ultimately, we don't, we're not into embracing the idea that we ought to do this. It's all viewed as a pain in the butt. It's going to take more time. Buck up here and just a little stick and go about your business as usual. So, but there, there are all of these people coming up with ways to deal with this issue should you choose to. So I think the issue here is mentally, we just not, don't choose to. And then another way, I like number 31, another way to decrease the pain associated with IVs is not to start IVs. Uh, so here at a teaching hospital, they went around and looked at everybody who had an IV running and said, is that running because you're gonna need, you need the fluids or because we're putting drugs through it? And they found that 42% of their IVs were running, the patient wasn't getting it for fluids, they were taking oral fluids and there was no drugs running through it. So they were considered idle IVs. And, then, and by indoctrinating the house staff, they cut it, they cut it down from 42% of the IVs being nothing happening to 29%, which is, you know, a marginal, um, I think it's still bad. You know, we just start IVs in everybody, and in, particularly in the pre-hospital setting, every Tom, Dick, and Harry comes in from the, ho from the ambulance, has got an IV running, it's like, well, what the heck, did you get him any fluid? No, what, and it's one of those, well, it, you never know, doc, you never know, you might need it, they might, they might go into cardiac arrest right in front of our eyes here, we need to have that IV in place. And everybody in an ambulance, at least in the States, gets supplemental oxygen. Like 21% oxygen is not enough, no matter what's wrong with you. We need to give you more. If 21% is good, 30% is better. So everybody comes in, IV and oxygen, IV and oxygen. And, uh, and then they're in these uh, backboards, which is causing them great grief kind of thing. 33 to 38. Uh, discuss ways to increase the success rate of IV. Somebody was talking about that yesterday. Number 33, here's, a, here's a, a warming mitt. You put your hand in this thing here and it dilates all the vessels in your hand and you can uh, start IVs better. Now, th this is a commercial product. You wouldn't think you would need a warming mitt. You could just put a hot towel in there kind of thing out of the, uh, well, the blanket warmer is not, and not anything, not, is certainly not hot. Uh, but you, the idea of just rin rinsing out a towel and putting it under hot water kind of thing and wringing it out and laying it on somebody's hand just so that you could increase your chances in somebody who looks like they're going to be a tough stick. That's, that'll be the equivalent. That's 33. 34 and 36 and 37 and 38. Have you know, you know about this idea about putting topical um, nitroglycerin ointment on, dilating blood vessels? Anybody know about that? Do you guys do that? This is kind of, you know, it's kind of like, can't you get a systemic effects from putting stuff on topically like that? Don't they have nitroglycerin cream that you put on people's chest? Well, apparently, if you read all four of these papers, it's not an issue. They put this stuff on people's hands, it dilates the vessels, makes starting the IVs easier, and they don't get any systemic effects from it. There's four papers there that basically say this is a way to do it. And then lastly is this paper 35, Ultrasound visualization of hand veins. See, anybody do this? There's a couple of papers on this now that talk about we, we got the little probe here and we put it over the dorsum of the hand or the antecubital, we find the veins and we make it easier and they taught the nurses how to do that. You guys teach the nurses how to do that? Do they have a, a protocol? Or are you working on one? Yeah, in um, the literature on it is pretty straightforward. It, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to learn how to do this, and it increases um, you know, in what may be a difficult task. They, uh, they resolve this matter by visualizing superficial veins using ultrasound. So there's been a lot written on this stuff. And then lastly, the, the last myth deals with um, You know, orthostatic vital signs, I don't see that happening much anymore. Did, they dis did somebody just kind of discontinue doing orthostatic vital signs? Um, and, and the idea of uh, trying to detect occult hypovolemia through doing orthostatic vital signs, where you go high, horizontal, stand them up, blood pressure, drop, looking for a blood pressure drop or a pulse increase of 20 or 30, depending on what, what criteria you're using. The, the data on this <clears throat> is compelling, is compelling. And it's really easy to do studies in orthostatic vital signs. You just take somebody who's a blood donor, take 500 cc's out of them, do orthostatic vital signs and see what happens. And the studies on this basically say you cannot determine, you can, but orthostatic vital signs will not pick up somebody who's lost 500 cc's of blood. 
when you, by the time they take a liter of blood out of you, you uh, um, yes, they're, they're, they're positive by then. But, but the whole point of this stuff is to detect occult losses, not obvious losses. If somebody comes in and they get blood around their lips kind of thing and said, I've been vomiting blood, don't bother doing it. You've, the diagnosis is made. You've got some blood uh, loss problem here. But this is about occult losses. And the, these papers, paper after paper after paper says, you cannot detect with any reliability losses in the neighborhood of 500 uh, uh, mLs. And, and my favorite paper, I, I, I don't want to go through all of these. They are all the same. The sensitivity and specificity is terrible for standard measures of orthostatics. The one I like the best, though, is my favorite is number 46. I went out to the waiting room of the emergency department and did orthostatic vital signs on um, 132 adults who had absolutely no reason to, to be hypovolemic. They were here for a cut on the, on the leg, uh, sprained ankle, uh, I get a toothache, whatever it was, none of them had any reason to have been uh, hypovolemic. So they did orthostatic vital signs. And look at the changes in the heart rate. The heart rate in these people went, went down. The, on one extreme, the heart rate became five beats per minute slower. On the other extreme, the heart rate went up by 39. The average change in heart rate was a, an increase by, of 17. And they did uh, systolic blood pressure changes uh, and a decrease, of um, a decrease of 20 millimeters of mercury to an increase of 26 was the range in these 132 people. Using standard criteria, 43% of the people who had orthostatic vital signs who were euvolemic had positive tilt tests. 43% of the people in the waiting room had positive tilt tests who had no reason to be hypovolemic because they weren't hypovolemic, reflecting not that they were occultly hypovolemic, but this measure that we use is just totally unreliable, totally unreliable. Like 45 is, is another one on, you know, the blood donor kind of thing, easy stuff. Alcoholics can be associated with a falsely positive tilt test. And 42 and 43 are both about healthy people, adolescents, can have large changes in orthostatics on standing and can result in the conclusion that the patients are hypovolemic when they aren't. I remember going into the ER one time, it was a change of shift, and there was a person who had had some vomiting getting uh, IV fluids. And periodically they would do orthostatic vital signs and every time they did orthostatic vital signs they came back abnormal and up went another liter of IV fluids. Um, not taking into consideration that maybe the orthostatic vital signs were the issue. I mean, if you vomit two, three times, I mean, does, does that mean you're two, three liters down? Certainly not. But this doctor, being a scientist, was basically determining the ongoing need for IV fluids by re repetitively doing orthostatic vital signs. And this person, who was a young person, kept on having low, you know, numbers that suggested that the person was and if we didn't stop that because of the change of doctor, that person would still be in our ER getting liter after liter after liter because they were chasing this orthostatic vital sign thing, which was, which was incorrect. And then lastly, there's the papers that talk about Trendelenburg position. That's number 47, the literature review. Somebody's in shock, you put their, uh, you know, you tilt the bed, heads down, legs are up. The uh, available evidence does not support the use of trendelenburg positioning in patients with clinical shock and even suggests that this intervention may actually be harmful. Why? Because it puts all of your bowel content on your diaphragm kind of thing and maybe make it a little harder to breathe. And then what is this thing about late raising the legs uh, um, of people who are uh, hypovolemic? Um, 52 and 53 conclude that passive leg raising alone does, doesn't do much because there's not much blood in the legs. So those are three things to consider.